ベテルゲースロマニコンティです。Insanity of this episode, man! Despite the massive casualties within the village, the battle had seemingly been won. The fingers had been eradicated. Subaru and the party were about to taste victory. My boy was about to embrace Goddess Leoton in his arms. The reunion was about to be beautiful, and what happens? The feed Metal Gaze strikes again and takes over my boy's body, dude. Yusuke, absolutely incredible. With the voice acting in that moment, how twisted and contorted his face was, the fiendish level so high, the feels in those final moments, dude. Subaru begging to be killed by Julius and Fetus, dude. Once Fetus broke into tears, that killed me. Fetus, Felix, however you want to say it, I pronounce it Fetus. My boy, man, it's, it's powerful. The, those lines and the words that he spoke to Subaru in that last moment where he's like, Feel free to resent me for this because I will resent this myself as well. I don't even think people have the impact of what that scene truly means and how powerful it was. That got me. That shit tore my heart into pieces, dude. If you guys don't understand why I love Fetus so much, it requires knowledge of EX vol- you know, novel volume one and what transpires in Cruz and Felix's past. I'm not gonna talk about that here. I know many anime owners are not aware of the events that transpire there. I will be making a video on it in due time, so you just have to wait for that. But dude, the feels, the emotions, man. Leoton, you know, that, that turn at the end as Julius delivers the final blow and the pain in his face as he has to do it, as he has to turn and kill Subaru after how incredible the dynamic is that's built up between them is, dude. Subaru, just like, to kill me. It's, it's necessary. This is the only way to win. I was saying it to myself at that moment. I was like, yo, we need the returns. We need to subvert this. This is twisted. But the very fact that Betelgeus was able to take over Subaru's body, the words he utters when he does so, and many things that I've gleaned throughout the episode, there's so many new theories coming to my mind, so many questions that I want answered. But at the beginning, on the onset, it confirms the thoughts that we first constructed during the episode 18 discussion stream, the theory crafting stream we did there, where we He said that in that moment where Puck was freezing Subaru, a twisted and fiendish laughter that we heard, that Subaru himself said that he despised and hated, was in fact Betelgeus transferring his consciousness into the man's body. These are confirmed. That's how it works. But it, as I said, it opens up new questions that I'm going to run through in this video. And ultimately, there's so much to discuss. Re Zero Episode 23. I don't even know where I want to begin. Let's, let's just start at the beginning right now because there, we had the Leoton greatness, some great pup dialogue, even more Battle Gaius insanity, and so much shade trickling and lurking beneath the surface of this series right now. We only have two more episodes, dude. I'm not ready. I have no idea how this will really round itself off with the final episode of this season, but dude, from what I've heard, I know it's going to wreck me, so I need to steal my resolve. Now, if these episodes are any indication of how insane that shit's gonna be, let's go, man. So, getting into it, the first thing that I want to talk about is, in fact, the bait and switch that we had with last week, that cliffhanger. That was one of the possibilities I said, that it very well could just be misdirection trying to build up some shade around Ram just to dispel it at the beginning of this episode and throw us off as a viewership. And that is exactly what it was to an extent. But in thinking about the bewitching spell that Julius gives us insight into, dude, my boy Julius is amazing. I, I loved him in this episode 100%. But regardless, talking about the, the bewitching spell kind of rooted in these blue roses, emitting this scent that kind of took over people's perceptions and casted this illusion, I still think that that's something initially constructed. Via Rosewall's magic, and that was set up to a, a, as a as a general defense, and as an addition to the to the barrier surrounding Rosewall's territory, um, at his behest by Ram, thinking that Cruz's camp was about to invade, and that was actually what was going on based on this blank letter, which I'll get into in the fir- in, in in a second. So, dude, from the beginning of the episode, as soon as I saw Petraj not moving, dude, Petraj, fucking MVP at all times. I love the line where Subaru is like, "Yo, if this was real." Pasharaj wouldn't just let me die like this. He'd be doing something right now. And it's like, yo, of course he would, man. But seeing through that, that guys, and thinking about it a little bit, we see that Julius is able to break free from it 
because he is in fact a spirit arts user or as he likes to call himself a seide kishi a spirit knight dude that shit is crazy the questions concerning the red seide from last week's episode are answered it is revealed to be a lesser spirit under julius's control named ia and dude that that ia is, is definitely crucial to some of the thoughts that i'm having right now i'm going to bring her up later on in this review so keep that in mind but you see that he wields you know different lesser seide each one with a certain color i'm guessing representing an individual elemental affinity that each one has based on the elements that we know are at play, you know, with magic in this verse. So that's crazy, dude, to see that. And I love the line that he throws out there where he's like, you know, even still, I prefer a Seide Kishi because my, this hasn't prevented me from training with the sword. And I'm sure that his contracts with the spirits and, and his, you know, affinity with the spirits is nowhere near the level of, of that of Amelia. But at least my question as to why the color discrepancy is confirmed to be, you know, an elemental thing for me personally, because that was one of my possibilities that I was throwing out there, other than it being some sort of warped and dark Seire, which that actually has some relevance to what I want to talk about in this video. But I'm going to save that for a second. So that was amazing. Ia, Ia was really a, an, and truly an MVP during this episode, but I'm going to leave that for now, and we're going to move on and talk about some of the smaller things that are going on in this episode. Ram, pure love right now, dude. Ram was absolute love. I loved her dialogue where she's basically like, you know, you, so, so this is what you do. You bite the hand that feeds you. And then after they clear up the whole misunderstanding, she's like, so you're telling me you're still Amelia's loyal dog. I'm just like, dude, the, the, the bodice, like everything about her. I forgot how much I loved Ram because she's been overshadowed so much by the true goddesses of this series. But she's still a great character in and of her own right, man. And I absolutely adore her. And I love when she basically issues the command from Rosewall for the villagers to start packing up and leaving, you know, trying to aid Subaru's case with him pleading to them. He turns to her and he's like, so does that mean that you finally acknowledge me? The, the, how you're willing to, you know, jump to my defense so readily? And that little pout she does. I'm just like, dude, Ram is amazing. I'm so glad there's no kind of warped shade around her. I'm so glad that my weird out there thoughts about Battle Gaze, which wouldn't have been that far of a stretch now knowing what we know, although... You know, my theory is being confirmed that he is, in fact, taking over people's bodies and transferring his consciousness, and it's not just rooted in the fingers, nor do the fingers share this kind of hive mind mentality, which was another possibility. It wasn't that much of a stretch with, you know, Ram's precognition and being able to see through the various animals of the forest that he could have done that through that, but I think there might be limitations in the way this works that I want to discuss about in this video, and that's the main theories that I want to lay out there, is as far as how Betelgeus' transfer works and things like that, but we're going to save that, like I said. So next the next thing I want to talk about is the blank letter. Blank letter is sent, and my initial question about it was like, so who would have done this? I generally trust the Krush camp, but Subaru is saying that he sent a handwritten letter, and I went back and looked at episode 22 where this is first mentioned as he meets with Julius and the rest of them before as they're planning their strategy against the witch's cult. And Subaru states two things. One, he had sent Anastasia and Russell Fellow in order to warn the surrounding villagers of the imminent threat and tell them to evacuate. And two, that he had sent a handwritten letter to the mansion via a messenger from Krush's camp. So upon going back and looking at this, my perception of this whole situation has changed slightly than my initial reaction in the, the LR that we just did. Because I was thinking, yo, Russell Fellow or Anastasia tampered with that. Those are the two factions I'm not really trusting right now in this whole arrangement. I genuinely trust Crucius camp. And especially Russell Fellow, man. I, I, I'm not letting go of the shade there. I still think the man is shady, but... I can't put this on him if it was wholly done within Crucius camp. So we have to ask ourselves, who tampered with this letter then? And instantly, the thing that gets me as well is the specification of it being a handwritten letter. Because think about it this way, Subaru still hasn't mastered reading and writing in, the, in, this, in this language. So he couldn't have actually penned it himself which means he dictated it to somebody to pen for him. And he says that it's exactly as he said, so he must have trusted said person. But at the same time, he doesn't really raise any issues about it. So I'm not just going to cast shade randomly all over the place, but that's something interesting. The person who tampered with this knew that, you know, a blank letter is seen as a declaration of war and wanted to incite, you know, problems between Rosewall and, and, and the mansion and Crucius Camp and the, and, and the Hakage Suppression Force that was making their way there. So it could have been just for shits and giggles. It could have been with a more nefarious plot in mind, potentially trying to bring about some casualties in that whole situation. 
We have to ask ourselves, who's behind sending this blank letter and for what purpose, dude? Or if somebody on the other side tampered with it, maybe, again, Rose, while just trying to play games, somehow caught wind of this and, and, and set some things up, set some things in motion. Um, as far as people on Crucia's side, I really don't know who it could have been. I mean, assuming that Subaru sent these orders out before the battle with Hakage, because let's look at it this way. Anastasia and Russell Fellow went about, he gave them those orders before the Battle of Hakage. Seemingly, the message was probably sent before the Battle of Hakage as well, based on the timeline and when he brings this up. So, what if somebody, what if the messenger then, or whoever penned it, rather, encountered Hakage prior or something like that and was erased? Would that potentially cause the letter to change and revert to a blank note? That's just something crazy that's come to mind as well. Regardless... I don't, I don't want to think too deep into that. It's just an, an area of suspicion as to who would do that. I mean, even if that's the... Dude, I, no, I'm not, even, I'm not even getting into that. I'm not even getting, that opens up a whole other can of possibilities that I don't even want to get into. So we're going to leave that there. But next thing that I want to talk about is the scene with the villagers and Subaru requesting that they leave. Once again, you see the prejudice against Amelia, against the, her being a half-elf in general, the ties to Satala, them blaming this encroach of the witch's cult on her entirely, which they're not 100% wrong, you know, that it is to an extent that they are after Amelia, but to see that disgust and distaste and, and, and complete disregard for somebody who clearly genuinely cares about you all, as as Petra tells him, and uh, Petra's love, man, I'm so happy for that little, uh, I, I love that little girl, I'm so happy to have her back in my life, just even if it was a little scene, telling everybody how she was there, you know, warning the villagers the day prior, reconstructing the barrier, which is, you know, harkens back to the scene we saw last episode with her talking to Puck in her room and everything like that i'm just like how can you hate on this goddess like this i mean i understand and it's so incredibly realistic to have that that mentality and that prejudice and that bias but at the same time i'm just like you fucking idiots man and i love felis's words in that moment where subaru starts to falter and he's like do you think what you're doing is wrong if not there's no reason to hold your head down i'm just like oh my. everything everything felis does in this episode pure love completely and utterly dominating the 10 Grand Kings of Trap right now, causing waves in my in my rankings of my top 10 traps of all time, currently occupying the 8th seat. Again, if you haven't, you know, if you don't know what happens in EX Volume 1, you're not really going to understand why I love Fetis so much, but you can uh, kind of get a glimpse from this episode and everything he does in this episode and how fucking amazing and incredible he is. So that's the next thing I wanted to mention. Into the chaos that begins to ensue in the village, we have to point something out, some, something out that's, that's very consequential. This was something that was pointed out to me right before I sat down to do this review and it opens up a bunch of questions so the individual one of the merchants that you know Phyllis points out is a member of the witch's cult and had some spell implanted into him similar to that that was sensed among the, the rest of the fingers and he comes in there with the kamikaze bomb almost takes Phyllis and Subaru out this man that's not the first time we've seen him. He was actually seen in episode 14 when Subaru was trying to find somebody to transport him back to the mansion and before getting involved with Otto's caravan. This is the same individual that directed Subaru to Otto and told him that Otto would be able to help him. Go back and look at the, the, the sequence of events near the end of episode 14 and you'll be able to see this. So you're telling me if this man was under the possession of Betelgeus and the witch is called from then, are you saying to me that Betelgeus orchestrated Subaru coming into the into this equation entirely, dude. And it brings me back to him and, and his, his his whole outlook of Subaru actually being pride and the lines he says last episode about him not being anywhere in his gospel. But if that's the case, then how would he have orchestrated and manipulated this? So I feel as though there's something even deeper going on here. If that is the case that this man purposely led Subaru to Otto and wanted him to make his way to the mansion for whatever purpose his presence being necessary for the ordeal. Maybe all along, Betelgeus wanted to get a, hand, a hold on his body. Who the fuck knows, man? But that's just something interesting to note that this man actually sent Subaru to Otto in the first place, and he most likely was already under this spell of Betelgeus from before then. So that shit was crazy. And then, yeah, this is this is where it comes in. Yeah, the Red Say a MVP, shielding Subaru in that moment. Fez being like, yeah guard, protect him. And here, here's the question that we have to ask ourselves. How the fuck did Ferris survive that? Okay, how did Ferris survive that point blank explosion? When Subaru comes to, we see her in these rags. She's like, I can't use healing magic 
to restore my clothes. So you can easily instantly say that she, being one of the most vaunted, you know, healing magic users in this entire verse, was able to patch herself up. But if that explosion was as crazy as it looked, you would assume that she went out based off it. So does she have some self regenerative properties that heal mortal wounds automatically and that's how she survived potentially she could have like a phoenix down kind of blessing similar to and and this this i'm taking from things that i, I that that are known as far as reinhardt's blessing list he has something similar to that as well which is hacks i'm not going to talk about that too much here but could Felix have something like that as well? Because it's crazy to me that Felix survived that based solely. And so that really speaks to the power and efficacy of Felix's, you know, hailing magic as well. I don't know why I started calling him Felix. Felix is hailing magic as well. But anyway, with that out of the way, I gotta give, gotta give a shout out to Willem. Man went in, dude. Will G is a boss at all times, even at the beginning, confronting Ram, stopping her point blank, and of course, Ram's resolve being such that she's like, just kill me now, this is a disgrace. I'm just like, oh my god, these characters are absolutely incredible. Seeing him go in against that finger had him bested, but all, every single one of these, and that's the thing about Beta Gear's ability that makes it so ha so hacks, is all of the fingers were expendable to him, using each one for kamikaze explosions and the like, and then just transferring over to another one. She was crazy, critically injuring Willem to the point where he was out of the battle if it weren't for Fela's healing, Willem would have been done for quite some time, he'd had to recover for quite some time, so that's is crazy that he was able to one-up Willem in that, in that situation. I love Subaru's tactics, where he goes and grabs one of Amelia's stones that, that is maintaining the barrier, and leads one of the fingers into the forest with the Wulgarm, which just devour her. Speaking of the fact that, you know, they're, they, they can't just generally be controlled at the behest of any of the Archbishops or any of the Witches cult members, there's more to controlling Maju than just that. So that's something interesting to note as well, something that I wanted to bring up. Um... But then let's get into the final scene. First of all, Amelia coming in there, dude. When she came in, when I heard that line, that's enough villain, dude. And she was going insanely, dude. The, the, the ice magic on another level. Crafting trees to use as perches. You know, freezing Betelgeuse point blank in that final moment. Absolutely crazy, dude. And all the, all the while, Betelgeuse raving about, you know, how grand and what a grand destiny this is. You know, his witch has descended to him, his love's guide. And every time you hear Betelgeuse's raving, you have to take it with a grain of salt, right? But at the same time, this this gives more insight and a little bit more credence to my thoughts, especially with Amelia's last line when she frees him, thank you for being defeated. You know, you can interpret it, you could read deep, more deeply into it and interpret it to have links to the theories I espoused in my Amelia's secret video. If you haven't seen that, check it out. I'll probably link it in the description below. I don't want to rehash what I said there here. But it could have implications and confirm some of those theories. My boy Puck, dude. Puck's banter at all points. And even earlier in this episode, and this is, I'm leaving the portions of Subaru and Julius's dialogue for the end of this to get into my theory, but even when Subaru dropped that line where, where you know, after Julius talks about the affinity and he's like, the only spirit I've ever had an affinity with is this, is a certain great cat. I'm just like, dude, I want to see my boy Puck back and, and have some banter with Subaru and everyone else very soon. And to see him in this episode coming up and he's like, I can't blame you for being charmed by my beloved daughter, but I won't allow any unwanted pests to get in her way. And he starts going in against one of the fingers that Betsegeus is controlling as well. I'm just like, yo. And then, what's me, I, I, there's, there's some, another line there that we could potentially read into in terms of Puck's knowledge of the witches of, of, of Lauren and him being around at that time period, potentially the links to Amelia and everything like that, especially knowing that he has insight into Sashla like that. Betsegeus talks about how this is proof of the witch's love for him. And again, that links to potentially confirming some of the theories that I had in the Amelia's Secret video, but Buck says that proof doesn't exist. Your crush is one-sided. And I wonder if that speaks to, because I was speculating last week that potentially there's somebody outside of Sato herself, I don't think potentially Sato is the one issuing orders to the, the cult, similarly to how I was saying, was Sasha actually the one that crafted the gospel? I wouldn't think so. It could be one of the other witches, and they could be the ones that, that are actually controlling the cult under that, that banner. But at the same time, there could be another individual in this verse that's outside of the witches that presides over the archbishops and, and is the one that's issuing these orders. 
And that line from Puck could be speaking to the fact that even though they believe that they're working towards the love of the witch, she doesn't give a shit about them. And she none of this has anything to do with it. So that, that could be one way to interpret it. Um, it could also speak to Puck's knowledge about what's actually going in, you know, going on here more readily. Same with, with Rosewell. But I need to make it... It's become increasingly apparent to me that I need to make a separate individual video, video on Rosewell because I bring up the shade and different points of uh, that issue here all the time that he could potentially know about Subaru's return, similar like to how I think Bayako knows. But... It's something that I really want to flesh out because people have been asking me um, questions here and there about it and what my thoughts are on that after last week's theory crafting and everything like that. So I'm going to get into that at one point. But anyway, I digress. Amelia was pure love in this episode. I'm so, it was so amazing to have her back, see her shining, see her going in in battle. And then we were this close to a reunion between Subaru and Amelia, them finally being able to reconcile and move forward. And then this fiend takes the man's body. Now, there's there's things that I want to talk about in terms of how Betelgeus' ability works. Is it an authority or is it something unique to him? I personally, if it's an authority... And that even that that's even crazier to what the the potential other abilities of the rest of the R bishops are within the witch's cult. And I still think they're gonna have their own unique you know authorities that are absolutely insane. But what if this isn't actually an authority? And there's certain things in this episode and last episode that lead me to believe that this might be something inherent to Betelgeus himself. So first of all, let's talk about the next magic you know ability that that Julius uses at the beginning of this episode in order to break everybody free from the bewitching spell and he's basically like it's ability that connects the gates of those in range okay is what is what he tells Subaru um and he and he goes on to say because of the the stark effects it had on Subaru that spirits mistaking the tuning of said spell is unusual and at first, I was like, well, this could be easily thought of as because Subaru's gate is broken and it's completely in tatters right now, as we know, it really needs to be repaired, that it had this effect on him. But then Julius goes on to state later that, you know, it's because he could potentially have a high affinity with the Sede as to why it had this effect on him, right? And I instantly, you knew there was implications to that dialogue and ways that it could come in. It's, it, at that moment during the reaction, I was thinking of things like, oh, potentially, you know, Subaru at, the, at this at this other layer stage, if my theories and thoughts, my crazy theories and thoughts about Puck and the Great Sayer are confirmed, potentially that could, could have something to do with Subaru's future late game in the series. And that's not really something I want to talk about here because it's still a ridiculous theory I can throw out at another time. You know, it could have to do with people's speculation about Subaru and links between Subaru and the Flugel based on the writing on the, on the Flugel tree. Regardless, I was like, this is crazy. This is something that we have to key in on. But it was after seeing that Ia, when I went back and looked at it, that Ia was rooted inside his body, that Julius actually planted Ia there to protect him at all times, which goes back to last week's episode when Ia appeared and Betelgeus freaked the fuck out when he was controlling that first finger and the, the unseen hands were going, you know, everywhere. And he was like, a Seire, a Seire, and he was, and he was going, mad right um i was wondering what what why he, it was so detrimental to him he didn't have that that stark reaction um but you saw that hatred towards puck as well and going back and it's something i want to look at to kind of confirm these theories i might make an individual video on it but i just want to throw it out for now i gotta go back and look at the dialogue between puck and, and betelgeus in episode 18 at the beginning to see if there's even more insight into this but Here's what I want to what, what I want to throw out there as far as Betelgeus' ability is concerned. What if it's rooted in Betelgeus being a spirit himself? And not like a great spirit of Puck's level, although maybe it could be, but more of a malevolent, dark spirit. You know, if we have, you know, good lesser spirits, you know, there's probably rankings and hierarchies. We have great spirits to the spirits. What if there's a dark side, a, a reverse side to that coin? And aside from the Maju, which I wouldn't count into this, you have, and I said this last week, thinking about the actual Ia spirit until it was confirmed to be just a regular lesser spirit that had a, a flame elemental, you know, ability is what I think about it. But regardless, what if he's some sort of malevolent spirit? Okay, and that's how he's able to go from consciousness to consciousness, from body to body. The first Betelgeus body we saw potentially wasn't even his real vessel, his real body. And he's been doing this, and this this also leads back to my Amelia's Secret video, into his history with the cult and potentially how long he's been alive for, for many, many generations. Transferring from host to host as he's about to die or when he's about to be killed, transferring over there, and he's of the caliber potentially of a lesser spirit, but a 
little bit stronger and of a, a, a malevolent infinity. Here's the things that make me think this, first of all. He says this when he when he when he goes in because you have to think about what his ability of transfer is limited to. If it's such that he can only take over people that have an affinity to to the witch herself, if they have the witch's love bestowed upon them, all we've seen him take over are the fingers and Subaru. So it could be limited in you know the scent of the witch of envy and the, in the scent of Sasla, or it could be outside of that. And then what are the other possibilities? Is it people with, you know, affinities for spirit, spiritual affinity that he's able to take over? Because when you see him go into Subaru's body, Ia is jettisoned out. Ia flies out of Subaru's body as, at the very moment that Bethel Gaius possesses him. And so I'm like, yo, so is it is it compartmentalized that only one spirit can reside in his body at once? Because Bethel Gaius being a spirit went in there, Ia flew out of there. He could, could no longer reside in there. Bethel Gaius overpowered Ia and took over his body. And that's just something I want to throw out there that could very well explain how he's doing this, how he's taking over people's body. I mean, it could just be that it's part of his authority as the sin of sloth, and that's one of the abilities that he has is to transfer his consciousness. But what if he is, in fact, a spirit? What if the way he freaked out towards the end initially was, you know, a result of that and then has something to do with that and ties to that as well? So that's a theory that I wanted to throw out there as to what could potentially be going on. But this episode as a whole is making me think about a bunch of crazy possibilities as to how this is going to go. We have to ask ourselves where the, the checkpoint is going to be at this point now that Julius has killed off Subaru to prevent this complete takeover and we're getting another Returns by Death. I know for a fact it has to be after the Battle with Hockey Gay. There's no way we're going back to before the Battle of Hockey Gay. But where is it going to be exactly? Is it going to be right after where they meet up with Julius and, the, and that party? Is it going to be after they kill the first Bethel Gaius body? Is it going to be at the beginning of this episode where we encounter Ram? That's something I want to know because depending on that, it's going gonna, it's gonna to really read into the pacing of how these final two episodes go and what really transpires. So we'll see what happens when we get there. But overall, this episode was absolutely insane. The feels, the action, the insanity, that ending sequence, the voice acting was absolutely superb. Again, you scared. That was, that was magnificent. That was, still, I think Matsuoka has, has done incredible things and set the bar high for Metal Gaius' dialogue, but the way that these voice actors and actresses for the Fingers and, and, and Subaru with, with Yusuke have stepped up in order to portray this persona is incredible. So that's one thing I want to say right now. But let me know your thoughts on this episode of ReZero. As always, subscribe for more ReZero content. I'm actually going to have two, you know, special ReZero videos coming this week because we haven't really had any uh, this past week except for the news on Death or Kiss. So to expect two special videos for ReZero coming this week. Um, smash that like button if you enjoyed, and I'll see you guys later. Peace.